I just got very interested in environmental issues. And once you get interested in climate change, the first thing or one of the most important things you come across is the energy system. Because if you want to understand why we got into this mess, it really has to do with fossil fuels and the way we fuel our cars, our homes, our industry, how we run our electricity system. So not because I have a particular passion for electricity or something else, but because I care so much about the climate crisis, I decided to really focus on the energy system. Aloha, I'm Samantha Ruiz, Director of Regulatory Affairs at the Ulupono Initiative. I've worked on utility regulation in Hawaii for the past eight years at both the Public Utilities Commission and now at Ulupono. I'm a part of a huge, unwieldy, energetic team of advocates, researchers, policy analysts, and public officials pressing Hawaii clean, clean energy transformation forward. We've come a long way with almost 40% of our power generation now coming from renewable resources, but we still have a long way to go. I'm so pleased to be speaking with our guest today, Leah Stokes. Welcome, Leah. Thanks so much for being here with us today. Oh, it's so great to be here. Leah has become a vital voice in the politics and policies surrounding electricity generation and global warming. She's been trained in various fields at MIT, Columbia, and the University of Toronto and she's currently a professor at the UC Santa Barbara. She's also the author of the award-winning book, Short Circuiting Policy, and has been published in top journals as well as the New York Times, Washington Post, and The Atlantic. Uh, on top of all that, she's also a senior policy advisor at Evergreen Action and a senior policy counsel at Rewiring America. So let's first talk about the stakes. Um, there's a new Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report that just came out. Mm -hmm. um, what Can you share a little bit about the findings and what it means for a place like Hawaii? Sure. So the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, is a group of scientists from all around the world that really keep track of climate change. They think about the pollution side of climate change, meaning the greenhouse gases we're putting in the atmosphere, and they also think about the adaptation side, meaning how are we going to deal with the warming that we've already caused. The most recent report was on the pollution side, and it really called on governments around the world to accelerate action on clean energy in order to really tackle the climate crisis. Yeah, I think preventing the worst effects of climate change requires policy action, and we've been doing that for, for quite some time here in Hawaii. Um, I'm wondering, you know, knowing the progress that Hawaii's made so far, are there any recommendations that you'd give for the state on how we can do it better, do it faster, and ways to improve? I think in many ways, Hawaii has made a lot of progress in recent years. There's, of course, a goal to get to 100% renewable electricity by 2045, and that's a great target. But the next road stop along the way is actually only 40% by 2030. And as you mentioned, the state is pretty mm -hmm. much already there. So I think it would be ambitious for the state to increase that near-term target, to try to aim for at least 60%, which would be directly on that pathway to 2045, or to be even more ambitious, to go in line with what President Biden has called for, which would be 80% clean power by 2030. I'd also say as the state develops more renewable energy resources like wind and solar, it's going to be important to engage communities in that process and come up with ways that there are ongoing resource flows, that there are dollars in an ongoing way flowing into communities when projects are built. Yes, I can't wait to talk with you about that. <laughs> um, but before we jump into community benefits, I'm wondering, can you just do some framing around where, how, like, how does electricity generation fit into the climate crisis um, and also just the challenges Hawaii is facing? Sure. So climate change is fundamentally caused by burning fossil fuels. That is what is releasing carbon and greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so what do we have to do to deal with the climate crisis? We have to stop burning fossil fuels. Where do we use fossil fuels? We use it, of course, for electri electricity generation. Now, for the United States at large, that's about a quarter of the carbon pollution. 
In Hawaii, it's even higher, actually, because there isn't really a big industrial sector here or other parts of the pollution makeup that you have in other parts of the country. So electricity ends up being a big chunk of both the problem and also the solution to the climate crisis. Because if we can replace fossil fuels like oil being mm -hmm. burned to create electricity in Hawaii with clean renewable resources like wind and solar and geothermal, even tidal and wave energy, you know, that means that we can use that clean electricity, not just for what we already do, like lighting or, um, you know, our computers, our phones, we can also use that clean electricity for, for example, our cars mm -hmm. through electric vehicles. We can use it for if we're going to have air conditioning through things like heat pumps, right? So that's really that electrification pathway that goes along with the clean electricity. I have an EV right now and I, when I charge, I realize that we're, most of Hawaii's electricity is still generated by fossil fuels, by oil. I think we're like upwards of 60 or 60 or so percent. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always get in my head, you know, being a climate advocate, like, oh no, even though I have an EV, I'm still technically charging with fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And um, you made me feel much better about that last night. Can you just reiterate some mm -hmm. of the reasons as to why it's even though the majority of our um, electricity generation is from oil, why EV ownership is still a, a yeah. good thing? So even with the electricity mix today in Hawaii, if you use an electric vehicle rather than a traditional gas powered car, you're going to cut your pollution by about half already. And the EV is only gonna get cleaner as the years go by, right? Mm -hmm. Because what's happening is that we're putting on more and more renewable resources onto the grid. And so the grid is gonna get cleaner. And as you fuel up your car, that's going to get cleaner too. So that can really never happen with a gas powered car, right? You're gonna put oil in it from now until the last day you drive it. But with an EV, not only is it cleaner today to be driving that car, it's going to get even cleaner. And one thing I showed was that right now in Vermont, it's actually a 100% renewable grid. And so if you plug your EV into the Vermont grid, you have no carbon pollution as you drive around. And that will be the future for Hawaii. That's great. I do like that you gave a shout out to Vermont. I did my grad <laughs> program there. Um, it's a great place. Uh, shifting gears a little bit, uh, Hawaii's elected officials like to tout the fact that Hawaii was the first state to set a net zero energy goal, mm -hmm. but you gave Hawaii a, a B plus in terms of cleaning up our electricity generation. Uh, I'm wondering if you speak more to, to why we didn't get an A. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this sounds like one of my students that's not pleased with their grade. <laughs> Well, as I said when I talked about this on the public radio, the grade is not my opinion or, you know, just wanting to be hard on people. It's it's really what physics demands. It's what the climate demands. And the climate is telling us that things are already getting pretty bad. Mm. Scientists have said that we have to cut carbon pollution by about half by 2030 if we want to limit warming to 1.5 degrees, right? And if we want to cut carbon pollution that much, we have to make rapid progress on cleaning up the electricity system. In Hawaii, that would probably mean doubling renewable energy. So from about 40% today to ideally 80% by 2030. That would be an absolutely heroic effort, and you know that given your work. <laughs> but there is already one island, as you know, that is um, within Hawaii that is already getting close to that. And on okay. some days, there are parts of the state that are operating close to 100% renewables. So we know it can be done. It's a question of speed. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think the state has to move even faster than it's been moving. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Kauai has been blessed with the... Uh... Mm -hmm. Hydro, which yes. I think a lot of people on Oahu wish we had more of, but yes. there is Lake Wilson. Give us a solid 12 megawatts. There you <laughs> I'm go. I'm pretty sure, yes. if not more. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Hawaii's been on a on a great path in terms of its policy progress um, and just a collective action around climate goals. But I'm wondering, are there any countries or utilities that are really doing almost everything the right way or places that we should be looking to for, for some more innovative answers? 
Well, you know, renewable energy, as you mentioned, is pretty geographically specific. And so when we think about Vermont, why are they already at 100% renewables? Sure, it's partially because people cared and wanted to do things, but it's also because of the resources that they have available there. If you have a lot of hydroelectricity, mm -hmm. as you have, for example, in the Northeast, in parts of Canada, it's a lot easier to do it because hydroelectricity is a resource that can turn on and off and you can control it. And of course, the wind and the sun are not so controllable by man, right? The wind will blow and then it will stop blowing. And so there are some places that are able to get further down the line faster, but it's not necessarily because their governments are better. It's sometimes because the resources are a bit easier. So I think given what Hawaii has, the challenges like being an island that's really remote and each island within the group needs to have its own grid, those are really significant mm -hmm. challenges. But also some of the benefits that there are so many renewable energy options here, right? There is geothermal, there is wind, there is the potential for offshore wind. There's of course abundant solar. And so I think in those ways, there's. A a lot of opportunity here too. So I don't think that there are places that are really that much farther ahead. Um, you know, different places are making different uh, levels of progress. At least when it comes to offshore wind, Europe is much mm -hmm. farther ahead than the United States where yeah. there really isn't almost any offshore wind in the US yet. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a good point. I'm waiting for piezoelectricity to really make a, a, a splash on the renewable energy scene, mm -hmm. uh, but we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk a little bit more about your background, how you got here, and where you're hoping to go in this space. Uh, you have such a varied educational and research forward background. Mm -hmm. uh, how, did you, how did you land here? How did you end up in the climate space? Well, I was born in Canada and my father grew up in um, sort of a national park in Canada. It's oh. called Algonquin Provincial Park. It's a beautiful ecosystem, a little bit like the Boundary Waters in Minnesota. It's, um, you know, glacial lakes, fish, um, beautiful forests. And I think growing up in an area like that uh, was really formative in terms of being in nature, uh, wanting to protect the planet. And so I just got very interested in environmental issues. And once you get interested in climate change, the first thing or one of the most important things you come across is the energy system. Because if you want to understand why we got into this mess, it really has to do with fossil fuels and the way we fuel our cars, our homes, our industry, mm -hmm. how we run our electricity system. So not because I have a particular passion for electricity or something else, but because I care so much about the climate crisis, I decided to really focus on the energy system. That's so great. I actually have a similar story. I grew up in upstate New York mm -hmm. and my parents were, were more sustainable or more sustainable before it was a cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, and then in my grad program, actually, I had a professor say to the class, if you care about the environment, you have to care about energy. Mm -hmm. And if you care about energy, you have to care about the environment. And I think the point is exactly what you're just making. So much of our carbon pollution comes from the electricity sector. So it's something you just cannot ignore. Yeah, they're really two sides of the same coin, yeah. right? You can think about it from a climate perspective. You can think about it from an energy perspective. Mm -hmm. But these two issues are very linked. Well, and I mean, even from an impact perspective too, I think if we wanna mm -hmm. reduce our CO2 emissions as fast as possibly, we have to look at the electricity sector. Yes. Um, can we shift to your book a bit? Um, sure. I was telling you earlier that I find it so cool that someone <laughs> else sees the value and power of the Public Utilities Commission. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when I was first hired at the PUC and I was really excited and telling everybody and everyone was like okay <laughs> cool they just didn't get it yes. but um as you know public utilities commissions are incredibly influential in how utilities um really design this, the electricity system mm -hmm. and you know by proxy uh impact the the, the level of ghgs and, and co2 that we have in our atmosphere so i'm wondering um you grapple in the book with the paradox of pace. Uh, at the, mm -hmm. the end of the last century, it looked like clean energy, gen clean energy production might take off much faster than it has. Mm -hmm. um, and climate change was also less politically polarizing than it has become. Can you say what went, what went wrong and go through some case studies in the book? Sure. So, you know, 
a lot of the time when we have invested in clean, renewable energy resources, it's been during moments of energy crises when the oil price is quite high. So if you go back to the 1970s, for example, when President Carter was in office, that was a time when really important policies were passed that uh, enabled a bunch of new technologies really early scale solar technologies, wind companies. Uh, it was really amazing. But when President Reagan came into office, he reversed a lot of those investments. And took the panels off the White House. <laughs> yeah, and both <laughs> metaphorically and, and literally. literally. <laughs> yes. And that was quite tragic. I remember when I was reading some of the archives and looking at the 1990s, um, you know, and watching all these solar and wind companies that were incredibly innovative go bankrupt sold for cents on the dollar, for example, to Europe. You know, the United States really lost a lot of its leadership mm. and in the clean energy space when it uh, pulled back from clean energy in the 90s. And when you have these boom and bust cycles in policy making, it creates a lack of certainty for the industry, which drives up costs for the transition and also really slows it down. So that was the sad story. You know, mm. I, people may have seen the documentary, uh, Who Killed the Electric? car, for example, right? We could have had electric cars a lot earlier. We could have had solar panels cheaper a lot earlier right. and wind turbines too. But the sort of starting and stopping of the policy has been a problem. And so why do we do that? Well, the fossil fuel industry makes an enormous amount of money in torching the planet. That's just the facts. If we say we have to use less fossil fuels, there are some people, not a lot, but a very powerful group of people who will make less money. And those industries are, of course, quite heavily unionized and historically have paid workers pretty good um, payments and so for, for their income. And so it has been challenging to get both companies as well as sometimes unions in the fossil fuel industry to support the clean energy transition. And particularly when it comes to corporations, they have given an enormous amount of money to the Republican Party. People may not know this, but the Coke Industries company, the Coke Brothers, is actually a fossil fuel company. Mm -hmm. And they have put an enormous amount into the Republican Party. And so, for example, Senator Whitehouse from Rhode Island talks a lot about how the Republican Party is kind of bought at the national level by the fossil fuel industry. And that dynamic has made it really hard to make more progress on climate policy at the national level. Yeah. I'm just thinking... Um you know, because I think we're seeing this transition out of, of, I don't want to say fossil dominant, but I think more people mm -hmm. are starting to believe in the transition. And you even see big fossil fuel companies starting to shift their focus a bit. And mm -hmm. you know, now that it's become a mainstream narrative, there's more interest in it. And I'm thinking about with the existing power plants across the United States and, you know, with the coal plant retirements happening so fast, mm -hmm. Is the next play for the fossil fuel industry to then just like figure out a way to turn our waste coal into <laughs> hydrogen or, uh, you know, I, it will be interesting to see the the angle that I think a lot of those uh, influencers uh, are will take with the Republican Party and how they'll try to technically revitalize their their industry. Do you think yeah. that's something we need to think about or? Absolutely. I think a lot of where the fossil fuel industry has pivoted is towards gas, what we sometimes mm, call yeah, natural, natural gas, gas yeah. and what I call fossil gas. It's a fossil fuel. Yeah. Um, you know, I think it's a very important decision that Governor Ige made here in Hawaii to not turn towards gas as the next uh, resource on the state to say, no, we're not going to go from uh, oil and a little bit of coal to gas. Right. We're going to go to renewables. Mm -hmm. and that's an absolutely critical decision. And it's tragically not been the decision that the rest of the country's really taken. And so there's an enormous amount of gas infrastructure that's been built over the last 20 years. And every time we build a power plant, it lasts for 30, 40, 50, even 60 years. Yeah. And when we think about how we're sitting already in 2022, and we have to be at zero carbon pollution by 2050, if not earlier, how can we economically, let alone morally, continue to build new fossil fuel infrastructure? Scientists have actually been saying for years now that we cannot build any new fossil fuel infrastructure and keep within the, the warming limit, the 1.5 degrees. And that's because we'll have to be retiring these mm -hmm. projects before they come to the end of their useful life. And that's gonna make those projects even more expensive. 
Any, um, have you seen any places around the country that have come up with interesting ways to accelerate the retirement mm -hmm. of fossil fuel plants, mm -hmm. knowing that they're still on the line and have lots of depreciation yes. with, the, with the plant? Yeah, so what has happened with coal plants is that they have a lot of debt still in them. You know, coal plants may have been built decades ago, but they had to put more money into these projects because they had to put pollution control technology on them. And as a result, there's still hundreds of millions of dollars in, of debt on, for example, a single plant. So it's a huge amount of money right now in these coal plants. And the problem is that the coal plants need to keep running. They have to keep making electricity in order to get money from people so that they can pay back that debt. Mm. So how can we pay back that debt faster so that we can move to clean electricity that is actually cheaper? Yeah. In the vast majority of the country, you could shut down a coal plant tomorrow, put up a wind project, and save people money. Keeping that coal plant open is actually about making money sure. for those coal plant owners. It's not about delivering cheap electricity. So that coal plant debt is a big challenge. And we actually did an episode of my podcast, A Matter of Degrees, talking about the solution to retiring that coal plant debt. It's something sort of wonky called coal plant debt securitization, <laughs> a little bit weird, but we really break it down in the episode and we actually talk about how it's been happening in a place like Missouri mm. and Kansas, or actually quite a Republican place. Yeah. So this is one solution that we're starting to see that is a win-win in that it saves customers money on their electricity bills. It of course reduces local air pollution, which is very toxic for people's health, and it deals with climate change. So that's the kind of solution that we need to see. And we're thankfully starting to see even in Republican states. That's amazing. I can't wait to go listen to that podcast. because <laughs> I am a little bit of a wonk. And uh, yeah, I'm interested to know more about the debt securitization and, yes. and the play there. Uh, you're So obviously you're a political scientist. And in the book, you're also advancing an argument about how institutional change really works. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your framework and, and why does it matter for advocates? Yeah, so I think that in American politics, for good or for probably ill, interest groups have an mm. enormous amount of voice. So this means things like companies, fossil fuel companies, for example, monopoly electric utilities, as we have in Hawaii and most other states. They have a very strong voice. And particularly when policy making is happening in these more obscure regulatory bodies like the Public Utility Commission, it tends to be that utilities have a very big voice compared to everyday organizations or for example who you work for which is more representing the public interest right and so that unequal playing field means that utilities and fossil fuel companies have been stacking the deck in their own interests often that interest is to keep fossil fuels operating for much longer that they, than they are economically making sense, let alone making sense for people's health, mm -hmm. let alone making sense for the planet. Mm -hmm. And so what do we have to do is we have to learn to organize together within organizations to combat that really strong power of corporations. And you know, one of the ways that we can do that is actually have for example, intervener compensation programs at public utility commissions. A very wonky subject that many people <laughs> who I work with whenever I start going on about are like, what is she talking about? California has one. They do. Yeah. It's a fabulous <laughs> program. What does it mean? It basically means that if people like you who work, at the, who work in public utility rate cases or yeah. proceedings want to intervene in the public interest, there is money set aside to help pay for that work. And what the California case has shown is that this... Pro this program actually pays itself back, I believe, from a 14 times level. Wow. Because what these public people are doing is they're advocating for lower rates for people. They're advocating for cleaner air for people. They're mm -hmm. advocating for a more stable climate. And that all pays people back. So we need to think about how do our policies work? How does our structure work so that the voices of everyday people who care a lot about the climate crisis can be put into our institutions as powerfully as large corporations? Yeah, yeah, I think another really strong point to make for intervention in public utility proceedings is that often it's the voice of the utility that's the loudest yes. and there's not a lot else out there. I mean, depending on the size of the commission here in Hawaii, it's 
I would say 70 at its best, mm -hmm. 70 employees. Uh, and there's a ton of work. I mean, they regulate electricity, water, wastewater. So to imagine that they would have the ability to really dig into the details mm -hmm. with on different proceedings on their own, um, it's hard, it's hard to imagine actually. And so mm -hmm. intervention, I think, allows for the perspective, to, for the aperture to be widened mm -hmm. on these issues and having different voices absolutely does that. I really want one here. Well, and you, <laughs> your organization has been doing such important yeah, yeah. work on this, right? There's been new um, ways of thinking about how the utility is going to work mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. And you, your organization has been making a really important intervention in terms of saying, how should we think about renewables? How should we think about the business model? Can we move faster on clean energy? And as I understand it, it's made a really big difference. Isn't that right? I hope so. We'll see. <laughs> it's, we're, it's still very early in the PBR process. So yes, we'll check in with you in about five years. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we're already kind of talking a bit about solutions. I'm wondering if you should shift the conversation there and how to best achieve them. Uh, if, if the U.S. is to clean up its electricity sector, what needs to be done and, and by when? You talk not only about electricity generation, but also electrification. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you mean? How are you trying to advance this work? Yes, so when we talk about the climate problem and its solution, as we've talked about, it's so much the energy system. And so we know that we have to cut our carbon pollution by about half by 2030, this decade, if we want to try to limit warming to 1.5 degrees. That's what all the scientists are saying. So how do we do that? The first step, what I call the first linchpin, is to have clean, renewable electricity. The faster we can get to 100% clean electricity, the better. And President Biden actually has been calling for the entire country to get to 100% clean electricity by 2035. There is one utility, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, which has a plan to do that actually, which is very exciting. But I think more and more places are, are thinking about accelerating and asking themselves, how can we move faster? For example, in California, there was a bill introduced this week which would try to get to 90% clean power by 2035. So there's a lot of people thinking about how much faster mm. we need to go. And why do I call clean electricity the first linchpin? Well, it goes back to what we talked about before. When we have that clean electricity, we can use it to power our homes, our cars, even parts of heavy industry with clean power. And that means that electric vehicle you're driving will be running a lot less on oil from the electricity system and a lot more on wind and solar and geothermal. That will make that car even cleaner. So it actually gets to amplify its mm. impact over time. Clean electricity combined with electrification really is the pathway to cut about three quarters of carbon pollution in the country. Wow. That's a, that's a ton. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm thinking about that. Um, yeah, it's hopeful, right? Yeah, I'm wondering, so, um, you know, through your work with uh, rewiring and, I mean, really just everything that you do, are there any interesting solutions or some of your favorites yes. that stand out? Well, I think that there's a wonderful idea that's actually implemented in Hawaii that many other states are starting to look at, which is on-bill financing mm. for uh, retrofits of your home, for things like energy efficiency, solar panels, all this great clean stuff that we're talking about. How does that work? Well, you can actually do it already in Hawaii using the basically the Hawaii Green Bank. It's actually called the Hawaii Community Investment Authority. Am I right? Yes. The Green, in, in, yeah, Green Investment Authority. Yes. Yeah. So that is an amazing organization that would allow you to basically get some money up front and use it to, let's say, put solar on your roof mm -hmm. or maybe do some efficiency work, make your home cheaper to operate. Yeah. And then you pay it back through your electricity bill. But believe it or not, if you do this, your electricity bill is going to go down from the very first month. So you save money and you get to do the right thing. It's a really amazing program. I would encourage people to look into it if they're thinking, well, how can I afford to put solar on my roof? Or how can I afford to do a retrofit of my home? You can actually afford it and it will save you money from the very first month. It's not really like a traditional loan that you'd have to pay back because it all happens through your electricity bill. And by doing these changes to your home, you actually are going to save money. So that's a really great solution that Hawaii has been pioneering. 
And then, of course, the federal government has an absolutely critical role to play in making it cheaper for everyday Americans to buy an electric vehicle, to electrify their home, uh, to pay for their clean electricity bill, right? So that's why President Biden's $555 billion in clean energy and climate investments, which are currently in front of the Senate, Mm. waiting to be passed any day now, are so critical. And hopefully when that package is passed in the coming months, you know, it will bring dollars into low income, middle income, and even wealthy households in Hawaii and all across the country. That's great. Yeah, I'm thinking about the on-bill financing. It's, it's actually uh, something that a lot of developers are hoping to use for the community-based renewable energy program mm. here, which I think could be a, a really big win for a lot of small, smaller communities who want to implement renewable energy. Can you talk more about electrification and some of the policies that you think are working in other places and uh, could work also for Hawaii? Sure. So electrification in the Hawaii context is probably going to involve mostly electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. In other parts of the country where you actually need to heat your home, not here, <laughs> you would put in what's called a heat pump. A heat pump is a really efficient appliance that doesn't need fossil fuels to run. You just use electricity. You might actually find that it gets adopted here, particularly a smaller version of it called a mini split because it also cools your home. Mm. It's an air conditioner as well as a heater. And that technology replaces gas being burned in the homes. There are still about 70,000 um, homes here in Hawaii that are running on gas to some extent, maybe for cooking, for example. Mm -hmm. And that's something we also have to electrify. A lot of the hotels, yes, too. Yes, a lot of the yeah. hotels. And we need things like induction stoves for that. What's an induction stove? It's an amazing technology that cooks your food very precisely with magnets, basically. Wow. And yeah, it's much better for your health because it turns out when you have gas in buildings, scientists have been uncovering that it's really bad for your health. It increases the risk of children having asthma by 42 percent. And mm. it turns out that even when a gas stove is turned off, it's still leaking. And gas contains really bad stuff like formaldehyde and benzene, which are carcinogens, aka bad stuff. So more people are starting to think, hey, I don't want to have gas in my home. I want to have an electric home. And that can involve those heat pumps mm -hmm. that I talked about, which are like air conditioners, very efficient ones, can involve an induction stove. And of course, it involves things like an electric vehicle and solar panels. So those are some of the things that will need to happen in Hawaii. And I think one of the big um, investments that we need to see in the state is a lot more money into electric vehicle charging infrastructure. Thankfully, there is a bill that's already passed Congress that has money for that, and I'm sure there'll be dollars flowing into the state, and people working here are going to try very hard to deploy mm -hmm. those EV chargers fast, because it turns out already one in 50 cars in this state is an EV, mm -hmm. which yeah. is amazing. You have one, for one. example. <laughs> I've rented one while I've been visiting. And, you know, we need more and more people to adopt that. And as that number gets higher, we're going to need more and more charging infrastructure. Yes, 100%. I agree with that. There's a, I have a wonky question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is a lot of activity in the, spa in the EV charging space right now. Yes. Uh, the utility actually just recently put forward an application or a request with the Public Utilities Commission uh, seeking approval of about 300 ports, half of those being DC fast chargers and the other half being level twos, mm -hmm. um, at a really, really high cost, I think mm. upwards of like 80 million or so. Mm. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the utility's role in the electrification space in I guess broadly, but in Hawaii specifically, is that the is that the their most optimal role that's to be good, the owners? That's a good question. You know, utilities are monopolies, as you know, and so they don't always do things the most cost effectively. They don't really have competition all the time. And that's why it's so important to be having groups like yours intervene at the Public Utility Commission and ask questions like, couldn't you do this cheaper? It seems like that's a lot of money for not a lot of charging stations. How about we have a little competition, maybe right. a right. RFP where right. different companies can bid for who can put the chargers in the fastest. Because we know we need this technology. And if 
if there are more players in the space, then maybe the electric utility company will come back with a cheaper bid and be able to figure out how to put more of those chargers in for less money. Yeah, I also think it's really interesting. You know, we should be thinking about how are utilities collaborating mm -hmm. with the private industry as well. And mm -hmm. so maybe they're, they're best fit to do things like Make Ready, where they are doing everything from behind the meter. Mm -hmm. They're setting it up so that the private industry can come in mm -hmm. and take advantage of the opportunities here. Um, any other thoughts on really innovative policies or solutions that we should be looking to. There's been some conversation in the state about a carbon cashback program mm -hmm. um, that, that hasn't made it all the way through the ledge, but we're hoping next session. Mm -hmm. um, anything that you think is good to emphasize in that space? Well, I think that the state should take a good look at its renewable energy targets and how yeah. they could be accelerated. I think that's really important. I think that the state could think about passing a carbon price um, and particularly trying to levy that on tourists is probably a smart mm. idea because that will be a way to raise more revenue without necessarily putting it a lot on everyday people who may struggle yeah. to pay their energy bills. Um, in many contexts, when those carbon prices have passed, they've proven to be pretty unpopular. So it's important to think about if you are going to rebate some of that money back to people, making it really visible yeah. um, and making it clear. Because when people pay more at the pump, for example, for their oil to power their gas-powered cars, that's very visible for people. There are indeed giant signs everywhere when you drive around that say <laughs> what the cost of it is, right? And people notice that. Yeah. So it tends to be that the costs are very salient and visible for people and the benefits tend to be much lower. So for example, in California, which does have a carbon price, it's given back to people often on their electricity bill on a quarterly basis and people don't really pay attention. They don't, it, yeah. they don't really see it. Um, the, the way to make it more salient would be to give people checks, for example, but that's an expensive thing mm -hmm. administratively to do. So there's, it's a challenging policy, I think, to implement. I really um, applaud people working on it, and I hope that it will be politically acceptable and that people will like it, but at least in many places where it's passed, it has really struggled um, to get to a high enough level where that it changes behavior, but doesn't create backlash, mm. you know? Because as that gets more and more expensive, people don't like it, it also becomes more effective. So that's really the puzzle yeah, with a the, carbon price. The, you need to strike a balance between them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, jumping back to some of the comments you made earlier about the Build Back Better bill. Well, yes. that's a mouthful. <laughs> I'll say that five times fast. Uh, what did you like most and anything that you would do to salvage it? at this point? Yeah, so the Build Back Better agenda is an absolutely transformative um, agenda from President Biden and Democratic leaders in Congress. It's already passed the House. It has very transformative investments in clean energy and climate. In fact, $555 billion. That is the most money that I think probably any government around the world has ever spent in one shot on clean energy mm -hmm. and climate. So I think mm -hmm. it would be a game changer. It does things like create um, programs that make it more affordable for people to buy electric vehicles. And it's going to change the way that incentive works so that it's more accessible for low income people. It will also make it more accessible for people to get uh, money to put solar on their roof. Uh, and it will make it more accessible for people to retrofit their homes and electrify it and do energy efficiency upgrades. So there are actually a lot of investments that will touch people in their daily lives that will help them make that next choice of an electric vehicle. Mm -hmm. And what people may not know is that once you buy that electric vehicle, if you can get it up front for about the same price, you will save money over the operating lifespan of that car. Mm -hmm. It's extremely cheap yeah. <laughs> to fuel an EV. Even in Hawaii, where the electricity price is like the highest in the nation, it's still much cheaper than and driving. And to maintain. Oh, very much cheaper yeah. to maintain. You don't really have to go and fix up your car right. or do an oil change. Yeah. That doesn't exist. There are less moving parts, less burning of things. Yep. And so there's less things that break, yeah. right? Things that move tend to break. <laughs> and that's not as much the case with an electric vehicle. So what I think people may not realize is that an EV is not only a better car to drive, it's also a cheaper car to operate. So when that bill hopefully passes, 
it will be more affordable for people to buy the car and then it's going to be much more affordable for them to operate it. It's going to be more affordable for people to put solar on their roof and then it's going to be much more affordable for pay, to pay their electricity bills. So basically it's going to help people get that upfront cost out of the way so that they can save money across the long term. And that's actually why the Build Back Better bill is an inflation fighting bill because it makes things cheaper for everyday Americans. In terms of what I've been doing to try to get that bill passed, well, there is one way that people can get involved, and there's a website called call for the number four climate.com. And basically, it just has a phone number and a little script, and it will route you to the president, to Majority Leader Schumer, and to your two senators from this state. And you can just leave a little phone message with them. It takes two minutes, and if you don't know what to say, there's a <laughs> script for you. <laughs> exactly. And that's a way that people can kind of keep the pressure up and mm. remind the president, remind Majority Leader Schumer that this has to be a top item. And we are right now coming back to a new Senate session where the number one item on the agenda is supposed to be this bill. So so I would encourage people to reach out to um, their senators, to the president through the White House, as well as to Majority Leader Schumer. And they can do that very easily at this call, the number four, climate.com. You know, it's so exciting to hear about what this, this administration is doing for climate and also just seeing the action that a lot of states are taking. Um, I am personally a little, I guess, nervous about where we're going and how fast we need to transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, 2030 is not very far away. No. And so I'm wondering, do you think there's anything that can be done, anything that you might, might have included in the Build Back Better um, legislation to accelerate our transition? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you should ask that because the number one thing I worked on in the Build Back Better bill was something called the Clean Electricity Performance Program, which was a giant federal renewable portfolio standard or clean mm, electricity yeah. standard. And it would have mobilized $150 billion to help states like Hawaii and all the other parts of the country to move faster on the clean energy transition by basically creating a big carrot for utilities. Mm -hmm. A little bit like what you're doing here with performance-based regulation, where we said, if you do the right thing, if you move faster on clean energy, we will provide you with dollars to make that work from a financial perspective. Mm -hmm. The other benefit of that is it takes away the pressure on rate payers, on everyday electricity sure. consumers, and puts it towards general government revenues from the federal government, where we can hopefully tax billionaires and get them to fund a little bit more of the renewable energy transition, get them to pay their fair share. So, you know, that was the most important piece in some ways. It was certainly the thing that I worked on the most. day and night. Yeah. And unfortunately, after it passed out of committee in the House, Senator Manchin voiced his opposition to it. So it's no longer in the bill, tragically. But that is okay. Hope springs eternal. There are still <laughs> many other wonderful parts of the bill. And overall, this package will get us so much further and faster towards those 2030 targets. I really can't overstate how important it is for this bill to pass in Congress in mm. the coming months. I love that. Um, I think we're near, nearing time. So I just wanted to ask, you know, this work is incredibly inspiring, but can be exhausting. <laughs> you know, we are we are rolling the boulder up the hill mm -hmm. constantly. And so I'm wondering uh, if you could share your thoughts on what do you what do you need to be, to believe mm -hmm. uh, in this transition to do this work? Yeah. So I think that action is what gives us hope and motivation mm. and community. You know, a lot of my closest friends are people I work with every day. They're, they're like, you know, other advocates. They're even political staffers sometimes. And the reason for that is because they care as much as I do. And when you have a sense of shared purpose, when you're working with others, I'm sure you find this in your work too, it really is meaningful. Yeah. And having meaning is considered the real peak of human experience. It's, it's kind of the whole game here. <laughs> so I would say to people that the antidote for sadness or feeling overwhelmed is to get involved, to join an environmental group. For example, I know the Sierra Club is active here. There are other local groups. Yes get involved. You could get involved with your neighbors in a community solar project, for example. Maybe your kids have interesting things that they care about. Maybe there's ways you can get involved that way. 
By getting involved and joining with others, not only do you work on the solutions that we need, you also feed yourself in terms of feeling better about the world, knowing that you're helping move in a better direction. So activism really is the answer. Mm -hmm. And so I would just really encourage people, if they've listened to this, they obviously care enough. This is a very wonky subject we've had. <laughs> Issues. We hope you'll be back in Hawaii very soon. And um, yeah, looking forward to maybe even collaborating in the future. Oh, well, I've had an absolutely wonderful trip. Everybody I've met here has been so brilliant and hardworking and dedicated on climate and clean energy. I don't know if that's the stereotype for Hawaii. <laughs> maybe it's a little bit more laid back and surfing. But my experience has certainly been that there are brilliant, hardworking, committed people here. And I'm, I'm very hopeful about the future for this state. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you.